I'm one of those people that are, I'm not afraid of anything in the world, but when you walk on holy ground, it changes everything. For one pastor to give his pulpit to another pastor is a, is a very special privilege. I met Brother Richie, as he said, on a mission trip. It was like pouring oil into water. It was never going to work. The first conversation we had, I got up and walked away from him. My wife talked to him and got me settled down, and I came back. And Richie described me as, I, I told Richie that I, I never fit in with the other pastors. I, I never go to any of the things they do. I don't have friends. He said, well, you're, you're like a bulldog at a poodle show. Hallelujah. That's what I said, hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you for telling me what I am. I'm that guy saved by the grace of God. And if you don't hear anything today, I want you to take away from here that there's hope. Amen. There's hope for whatever situation you're in, for whatever storm you're going through, for whatever storm you came out of, there's hope. It's a different kind of hope. The people we see in the convenience store that are scratching their tickets and everything like Jose saying, I hope I win. That's a different kind of hope. That's a worldly hope. The hope that we have is that confident expectation in Jesus Christ, knowing and believing that he will do what he says he will do because he is God. So Richie asked me if I would come. And let me say this. I can't explain to you really why, but he, he invited me to breakfast in September, and we have met every Friday for breakfast First, it was like two alpha dogs sniffing each other, walking around the circles. <laughs> and then we got to where we would discuss the Bible. The playing field was level. But you know, there's one thing that, that's going to cause our friendship to grow beyond where it is. It's because that we're both a child of God. We both have the same relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you become a child of God, you are entered into his family. Don't let everybody, some pastors will tell you that everybody's a child of God. This is not true. Everybody is God's creation, but you are not a child of God until you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Then you become a child of God. I'm going to get my feet under me in a minute. I'm, I'm stalling right now. Let me try to say something funny. Like Richie was, Richie was being funny a while ago. I didn't have time to play when I was growing up, so I'm learning how to be funny. <laughs> Next week, I need to preach to my church. And by the way, my name is Michael Flannoy, pastor, senior pastor of Liberty Hill Baptist Church. And next week, I'm preaching on tithing, and I'm going to sock them in the nose. <laughs> so there was a family that left church one Sunday, and Daddy was driving, and he was complaining about church. Oh, the message was too long. Music was too loud. Didn't understand the announcements. People was talking while they were preaching. He was just laying it down. You know how you do when you leave church. <laughs> His little 10-year-old son was sitting behind him in the seat behind him looking out the window smiling. He said, but you know what, Dad? You have to say, that was a good show for that dollar you gave them to let us hear it. <laughs> So, you know, I'm here because of the grace of God, but I'm here because my wife, the prettiest lady in the room, 48 years, 48 years, started praying for me right after we were married. We were married very young. God saved my husband. And I, I've found, I've only been in church a little over 13 years. I was 52 when I came to the Lord. We're going to get back around to that, but I get to preach to you for a few minutes. I asked Brother Richie how long I had. He said, preach till they start walking out. So <laughs> I'm here. I tried to line this out where the message would be 90 minutes, the testimony would be 60, and down from there. So we ought to be out here by too easy. <laughs> but I hope that I can answer a few questions that most of us have. Thank you, Jose. My mouth's already stuck together. 
I'll get settled down in a minute. The Lord knows. He, he, uh, he knows. A lot of the questions people have when they come into the church is, am I in the will of God? Is God's will part of my life? Look, there's two different explanations there. Being in the will of God is not the same thing as God's will. God's will is found in John 3, 16, when, he said, when the scripture says he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. God's will is that none of his children will perish. Being in the will of God is something totally different. It depends on your walk, your relationship with Jesus Christ. And as I talk today, I want you to think about your relationship. Where are you in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Has God used you? The Bible tells us in 1 Peter that the master of the house will not use a dirty vessel, but he will use a broken vessel. So you remember some of these things as you, as this un unwinds today. I want you to think about your relationship and where you are. And I hope to answer another question in the way of, does God answer prayer? Well, I pray all the time and he don't never talk to me. Well, that's your answer. <laughs> I'm just saying. He's not going to send you a text. He's not going to send you an email or call you on the phone. God is sovereign. My answer to you this morning is God definitely answers prayer. It says so. In the book of Mark, chapter 11, verse 24, Scripture says, whatever you believe that you pray, it's already done. You see that word belief? Do you really believe God's going to do what he says he's going to do? My wife prayed for her husband for 35 years. Think, wrap your mind around that. Me and Jose is going to pray for something probably until next Wednesday. If we had not got an answer, we're going to change our prayer. But my wife prayed for 35 years. God saved my husband. And an, another question, the last question I hope to answer if you're listening is, does God keep his promises? The Bible's filled with the promises of God. So let me get started. Let me start with a simple question for you to think about. You probably have heard this question before, and you probably even already know your answer. But if you were going to go tomorrow morning, you've got to go to court. I heard Richie say a bunch of y'all been in jail. <laughs> I think I recognize a few of you anyway. <laughs> I've been on both sides of it. If you were going to court tomorrow morning and you're going to be, you have to forgive me, I can't stand here. You know, my, my, my older pastor in my church, he said, Pastor, you don't stand still when you preach. I can't. I can't. I'm sorry. If you're going to court tomorrow morning, and you're going to be put on trial and be accused of being a Christian. Would the prosecutor have enough evidence to find you guilty? That's pretty scary. My Bible that I read in the seventh chapter of Matthew, starting in verse 21, when the church is whining to Jesus about all the things they did, and he says to them in verse 23, well, here's the problem. Regardless of what all you've done, I never knew you. The God that I serve cannot lie. The Bible says so. And when he says, I never knew you, then there's, he follows that up with three fatal words that nobody in church would ever want to hear when he says, depart from me. Brothers and sisters, the talking is over. So what kind of a person will God use? Do you want to be used by God? Do you want to be in the will of God? And what does it mean to be in God's will? So I'm a, let me start off with something very simple. I want to share, I brought my resume. I want you to hear my resume. And if it, if it sounds like yours, if you hear any part of yours in it, I want you to say amen. I'm one of those preachers who like for people to talk back. I did not attend a fancy college. I was not in the top of my class. I'm not a founder, an innovator, a CEO, or head of any company. I don't have or never have sat on a board or any committee. I am the trustee of nothing more than my personal belongings. And my wife tells me where to put them. <laughs> I have never received an honorary doctorate. I have not been named most influential, never listed as most attractive or voted as most likely to succeed. Amen. I'm going through my resume here. I don't have any letters after my name. I had a number behind it before. 
I can't charge an exorbitant hourly fee for my time. I don't speak on any circuit, have never been given a, never given a speech, never been the keynote speaker less than once. There are no buildings, no streets, or hospitals named after me. I have a very unimpressive family background. I don't come from a long line of important people, and I'm, and I'm really just a nobody. Amen. I have some friends that have a little gospel group, and one of the songs they sing, I love the lyrics in the song. He says, I'm just a nobody that wants to tell everybody about somebody that can save anybody. Amen. That's what we're here for. That's why God has left us in this place. And all of this that I've just said to you, it's, it's okay with me. And why is that? Because God is utterly impressed with my resume. It doesn't matter. God snickers at any attempt by me or for that matter by you to, to prove our worthiness. Our accomplishments do not justify our existence and our accolades cannot merit us any greatness. To be a child of God is good enough for me. God is unimpressed by our collection of readers, likes, retweets, friends, followers, or admirers. He would say, don't drink your Kool-Aid because it ain't about you. I stated that when I first got saved, I can't tell you why, but God downloaded me with Scripture. It seemed like every... Every scripture that I read, I tried to memorize it. I wanted to capture it. I wanted it to be here. I wanted the Rolodex of my mind to be loaded because I'm a believer that what you allow through your eyes and what you allow through your ears will affect the condition of your heart. The Bible says so. It says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So whatever you have stored up in your heart is eventually going, it's like an alcoholic. If you, th if you know this is true, you can say Amen. A sober man's thoughts will become a drunk man's words. Amen. You give a man a couple of beers, he'll tell you what he thinks about you. <laughs> what are y'all giving away out there in that coffee bar? <laughs> the first verse that I really... I didn't even know I memorized it, and it stuck to me, was Isaiah 40 and 8. Isaiah says, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God shall stand forever. Amen. I mean, it's there. It is, it is immutable. You cannot change the word of God. For some of you, it may seem strange for this to be a, an important verse to me, but in retrospect, it could be the most important verse I've ever captured. Because we need to remember again and again and again that we're nothing more than grass. We're nothing more than grass. Disposable, temporary, fleeting, even momentary. We are technically only promised 70 years in this place. God changed everything. Now he has set it up where we are promised three score plus 10. The score is 20. So we're technically 70 years. Richie was telling me just yesterday that through medicine, modern medicine, Pretty soon, 10 years from now, people are going to live to be 100 to 110. Lord, what kind of shape would I be in? <laughs> because this stuff don't get new. You can get a, a knee replacement, but you can't get. We're going to go to heaven with what we, what we have. We have one life to live, church. And the usefulness of that life depends on not our resume or our accomplishments, but it depends on how much we will be used by God because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. You with me? You got to stay with me here. It depends on how much we will be used because God is, is like this kind of thing here. He will give you as much of him as you want. If you only want a quarter of a tank, you'll have a quarter of a tank. If you want a half a tank, you'll have a half a tank. But if you want to be overflowing, you'll have to be refilled daily by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Billy and I, my wife and I pray all the time, God don't leave us where we are. It was like I told you, I'm, I'm new to the church thing, and I have met people that are in church 60, 70 years, stuck. 
You know, like the water that don't move that gets that green slime around it and the frogs are not even in it. Stuck. Well, I've sat in the same chair, especially the Baptists. I don't know what y'all are. Richie said Baptistic. <laughs> something like that. But they'll, they'll, they'll put us something over the seat so you'll know this is where they sit. Don't sit there. Don't sit in the 70 years. My daddy was a pastor. That will not get you through the gates of heaven. That will not get you in the presence of God except for the judgment day. So we pray that God does not leave us where we are. But let me share with you the failure of the wisest man ever, Solomon. You know who Solomon is. Not Richie, but Solomon. The failure of the wisest man. Solomon was given a mind like no one before him and nobody after him. 1 Kings 3 and 12 says, Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise, discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. Solomon was the smartest man that ever lived. He was a brilliant poet, a skillful songwriter, a genius botanist, a first-class biologist, and he was exalted and a successful king. Some of the guys may like Solomon because he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. That could be a big trailer park right there. I mean, that's a lot of babies. That's a lot of child support. Solomon was da Vinci. Einstein, Bach, Jordan, Shakespeare all rolled into one superior man, but Solomon turned away from God. That's where he came up short. 1 Kings 11 and 4 says, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. You know, let me pull up here. Other gods. How many of you got a cell phone? How many of you can lay that cell phone down and leave it laying right there for one week? Don't tell a story. You've been drinking already. You said you were. <laughs> you will drive back 175 miles to get that cell phone. I left my phone. That can become your God. When you're looking in the mirror and you're like, I like these eyelashes I got last week. You can become your God. Materialism can become your God. Solomon was turned away by other gods. The desires of this world can turn us away from Jesus Christ. Yes. Having all the wisdom in the world didn't guarantee fidelity. Wisdom didn't guard him against a wandering heart. Wisdom didn't ensure his obedience. Don't get me wrong. Wisdom is important. If we lack wisdom, we should ask God for it. James 1 and 5 says, If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. We need to have wisdom to discern. It don't matter if you have theology degrees or have mothered a, a dozen healthy, happy children or started several 5013Cs to feed the poor and in sex trafficking, God is unimpressed. Being a, a creative, innovative, or highly effective leader is insufficient. We, we might make the Donald proud, but God yearns, yawns at our leadership abilities. I can't do anything without Jesus Christ. If it were not for Jesus Christ in my life, I would be dead and in hell. Hands down. I'm gonna get, we're going to get around to that. We might be a life-hacking productivity guru, but that don't make us anything more in God's eyes. We have to remember that God uses the foolish. God picks the scrawniest little girl to lead off his kickball team. God chooses the janitor with the heavy accent to share the gospel and save lives. God uses the overwhelmed, disheveled mother to nurture her children into spiritual giants. God commissions the invalid retiree to uphold dozens, even hundreds of missionaries on the mission field. God calls the autistic man to give the most profound articulation of his simple faith. My wife's youngest brother 
name's Trey, 42 years old, Down syndrome. When I came to the Lord, Trey then at the time was probably 28, 29. We had went to a wedding at one of her other brothers, and everybody at the wedding knew what happened. Something done happened with Michael. Like I had leprosy. They, they wouldn't talk to me. They wouldn't speak to me. I was at the wedding. And I had to go down to my vehicle to change and get a jacket or something. And Trey walked with me. Anybody know about down, down? They're the sweetest people. They're the sweetest people. When they get excited, they want to fly. They, they're just, uh, I love Trey. So we're walking down the sidewalk and, and not saying anything. And Trey said, God, oh uh, God, he said, Michael, I know what happened. I'm thinking, okay, Trey, what happened? He said, I know that you have accepted God in your life. He said, I want you to know I love God too. The simplest faith, listen to this, church, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and following. Consider your calling, brothers. And when you read that word brothers in your Bible, that means sisters too. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You remember what I told you in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21? Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, the Lord, the Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Church said, but Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do mighty miracles in your name? He don't want to hear that. If your resume is sparse and your intellect is feeble, your skills unimpressive and your wisdom just average, fret not. God can use you because he uses me. God wants to use those who look away from their self-sufficiency, from their ego. God uses all those who humble themselves before the cross, boasting only in him and his strength, his righteousness, and his accomplishments. God uses pathetic people for his glorious purposes to show his superior power. Do not begrudge your weakness. Do not lame at your insufficiency. Rejoice that Christ is all-sufficient and always dependable. Embrace your weakness, church, so that the power of Christ may rest upon you to reveal God's surpassing greatness. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, Paul writes, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. If you think about Paul, if Paul was alive today, he would be a contract killer for the mafia. That's really about what he was. That was his job. But I would tell you this morning, church, to be encouraged because God intends to use you in all of your multifaceted weaknesses, and we got some in this room. I already had a lady profess to need to go to AA this morning. <laughs> we, we have got weaknesses, obscurity for his glory. It's okay to be a nobody. In all you do, you have to serve somebody. Whether you know it or not, you're going to serve one or the other. There's a living hope this morning, and his name is Jesus Christ. There's a living hope this morning. I said all of that to, to tell you this. The person that God loves to use is the one who is sold out to him. You know, you see people at the swimming pool and they want to sit on the side and just kind of put their foot in the water. No, you've got to get in the water. There's a, there's a great book out, if you haven't read it, called The Fan. Not a fan. Who's the author? Not a fan. He might be a friend of Richie's. I don't know. It's, it's like this. You, you go to a Georgia football game, and you see the guys over there with their, their shirt off, and they got painting all over them. They know every statistic about every player on the field, but they've never been in the game. They've never been on the field. So let's get some, that's what I'm asking you this morning. Are you in the game? Are you watching the game, or are you a fan? We use the term sold out 
so loosely, sold out. You ever heard of somebody say that? Well, man, he sold out. Man, she sold out. Peter could have been a good example of being sold out, but Peter went from being sold out to being a sellout, if you think about it. He compromised his integrity, his morality, his authenticity, and possibly his relationship with the Lord. But God, ain't we glad he's a God of second chance? Ain't we glad that he's the God of again? Thank you, Lord. The apostle Paul, on the other hand, was sold out. Paul was all in. You know this card game that you see on TV? A lot of you may play it called Texas Hold'em. Anybody know the game? Brother's hand went up right quick. He probably owes some money. <laughs> in, the, in the card game, Texas Hold'em, when you think you have the best hand, what do you do? You go all in. Let me tell you this morning, the best thing for you to do with Jesus Christ is to go all in. He don't want part of it. He says so in the Revelation. If you're lukewarm, I will spit you from my mouth. He wants you to be all in. The Apostle Paul, listen to what he said in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. To think that Jesus Christ died for you, how could you give him any less than everything? In the Greek tense, this is for my breakfast buddy. Richie's very smart. I don't know if y'all know that. <laughs> they just don't give people PhDs just because you showed up. You have to take a test and read a couple of books. In the Greek tense, the term having been crucified means Paul's crucifixion was a permanent effect. I hear people use the term well, a backslid. No. The Bible that I read in the, in the first epistle, 1 John, says if they went away from us, they weren't with us to begin with. The di disciples, the apostles that followed Jesus Christ, you couldn't beat it out of them. They were all in. Sold out literally means from Marion Webster, completely committed, devoted, invested, Engaged to a cause to have no reserves about the decision you are making. To be willing to go anywhere, to do anything, to give up everything in order to achieve your goal by any means necessary. That's where our relationship with Jesus Christ should be. Whatever it takes. Martin Luther King was sold out to the civil rights movement. Michael Jordan was sold out to becoming a great basketball player. Gandhi was sold out to his protest. In order to win at the Olympics, an Olympic athlete must be sold out to his training methods. If a medical student wants to become a doctor, they must be sold out to their internship. Every day that goes by reminds me that God needs men and women that are sold out for the cause of Jesus Christ. It's a war. It's a, there's a battle going on. In the time we live in, this time, it's easy to think that we are still standing yet totally drowned within the chaos, the desires and fears of this world. The world is full of sin. Think about this. What's the middle letter in the word sin? I. I. If you listen to yourself, and most of your sentences start with I, I want, I need, I am, I will, there's a problem. Because you see where that I, that I is right in the middle of the word sin. There's not even an S on the back of it. Sin is sin, church. Sin is sin. When we focus on the I, we take our eyes off of him. When we focus, a man told me when I first got saved, a friend of mine from way down the bottom of Africa, Cape Town. He said, Michael, walk with your head up, keep your eyes focused on the sun, and you'll never fail. I thought, he, I, I'm thinking, he's talking about the S-O-N. If we walk with our head up, focused on Jesus Christ, we will not fail. The great church father, Martin Luther, says this. Sin has two places, in the yoke around your neck, on the cross of Jesus Christ. Where is your sin? 
Well, Lord, y'all didn't know I was going to talk about sin, did you? Lord, help us, Lord. Are you sold out? Can you say this morning, you go to court tomorrow morning to be tried? Will there be enough evidence there? Or would the judge say, we're going to recess? Are you sold out this morning? Be it sold out means completely surrender to him that you've given it all up. Our time, our dreams, our values, our relationships, our possessions, everything about us belongs to God, readily available for his purposes. Going back to what I said, God will not use a dirty vessel. Think about this. If he's coming over to your house for lunch this afternoon, what would you have to go home and hide? What would you put under the couch? What would you have to wipe off your computer? What channel would you put the TV on? He's coming to eat lunch with you today. Sold out in Bible terms could mean this, born again. Because when you are born again, the Bible says you have become a new creation. You're no longer the old person. There's a saying where I came from, where I was raised up, that the best evidence of a changed life is a changed life. You ain't got to tell nobody what you are, who you are. They can see by the way you live your life. I have a shirt that I love to wear. It's got a saying on it by Martin Luther. You know, the shirt, it says, everywhere you go, share the gospel. Sounds pretty good. But underneath it said, when necessary, use words. You understand? So I wore that shirt everywhere I go. My wife, my son got tired of looking at it. They bought me 12 different colors. <laughs> everywhere you go, share the gospel. And when necessary, use words. You see what I'm saying? You don't have to tell people, well, I go to the First Baptist Church. Well, what does that make you? The reason many of us withdraw or step away from the church is because we're afraid of the cost. You want me to stop doing what? <laughs> Give up what? You know, you can, there's churches uh, everywhere that will go along with whatever your needs are. But my Bible, Lord forgive me, is laying over there. If my Bible says it's a sin, it'll be sin the day Jesus comes. Amen. Nothing can change the words in my Bible. We are afraid we will miss the pleasures of the world or we may run broke or afraid people will label us all sorts of names. I used to preach in a, a little barn church full of uh, probably wealthy Christians. Good to do. Not like us. We probably know what Boone's Farm wine is, don't we? <laughs> and I was preaching down there one Friday night when uh, the COVID came, stock market was down. And I made some pretty harsh statements about Job. You know, Job lost everything he had. But Job ripped his clothes. Naked I was born, naked I'll die. God gave it, God took it away, but he said, I give God the glory. And I said one Friday night, I wondered if the stock market crashed, did the Christians lost their money, would they rip their clothes and say, I'm giving God the glory. No, they start jumping off of buildings and getting their pistols out and... and Things are different. We're afraid that we're going to lose something. We're afraid that we will not meet the expectations of the one we stand for. Some of us are even afraid of being different. Different once we come to Christ. Romans 12 and 2, you have to love this. Is that, is that the clock, 1132? So I'm just now starting, right? Paul said, do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You remember when I told you that I couldn't memorize enough scripture? I have in my closet, the, my friend in the back, the white-haired guitar player, will probably love this. I have a, a, a stereo that I bought in Germany when my son was born 46 years ago. Uh, one of those pioneer systems that's probably worth a fortune. Stacked in the closet with 400 rock and roll albums that look brand new. But about three months old as a Christian, a baby Christian, many of you might call me, there was a lady in my house, a God-filled woman. She walked through my den. She looked around. 
you know, got Elvis, John Wayne, Holly Davidson. She's looking around. She said, you're an Elvis fan, aren't you? And I was proud. I said, yeah, I am. Mars' birthday, actually. She said, I said, I am. She said, you like Holly Davidson, too? I said, I do. You know, I'm feeling good. This lady's recognized my stuff. <laughs> when she left, I sat in that room. I looked around. I became convicted by the spirit. I said, I don't want to be recognized as the world. The next morning, I got me some totes. I started packing up stuff. My wife said, what are you doing? I said, this has got to go. I want to be recognized as a child of God, not a person of this world. I put those albums in that stereo in that closet. I don't listen to rock and roll music. I don't knock it. I want to hear music that brings glory to God. I want to hear scripture that brings glory to God. I don't want to hear people talking about the things of the world. I'm not into politics. I don't allow people in the church, in my church, to talk about sports and politics. We, don't, we come to church to worship God. Yes. To be in the will of God, you must be sold out. To truly be sold out, we must become Christ-like. We follow the one who made himself nothing to follow Jesus Christ. Sooner or later, we must embrace the circumstances that seem to demean us. You want me to what? Being in the will of God... And being used by God means we must be sold out to the point of being humbled. Andrew Murray wrote this. He said, the danger of pride is greater and nearer than we think. Look in the mirror. You know what James says? The man in the mirror. Look in the mirror. He said, and the grace for humility is even closer. Going back to what I said, how much of God do you want? So now we've got to get down to this. I want to tell you what God done. Has God used you? Anybody here been in church longer than 13 years? Ooh. Anybody here been in a relationship with God longer than a week? So nobody here is a new Christian. I remember when I first got saved, I was 52. Uh, one of the pastors came up to me and asked me would I lead a Sunday school class. I'd never read the Bible, never been in a church more than three or four times in my entire life. The only thing I knew about Jesus was his birthday was December 25th. But this man knew if I agreed to do what he asked, it would cause me to study, cause me to read, cause me to prepare a lesson, and it worked. Then when I, I found out how good God really is and how his grace is available for everybody, I came home one day and I told my wife, I said, we're going to start some house churches. No. I said, yeah. We're going down behind the Walmart. We're going over to the trailer park into apartments. We started 35 house churches. I had a horse trough on the back of a trailer. I'd take the horse trough to the trailer park and baptize people that wouldn't come to the church in the name of Jesus. I got into prison ministry for eight years I did prison ministry I, many of the prisons in Georgia went down to Angola and Louisiana uh, Brother Burkane, the, the greatest warden that ever lived that changed Angola from what it is 6,000 inmates to 52% of them now Christian 2015 I was the don't, 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 don't clap I'm just telling you what God has done 2015 I was named as a faith based contributor of the year for the Georgia Department of Corrections 2019, after my son came to the Lord, we saw almost 7,000 men come to faith in Christ in, in prison. I've been on 50 or so mission trips around the world from Cuba to Kazakhstan to Turkey to Toka, Alaska. Stayed with the Crow Indians for a while in Montana, and they asked me not to come back. <laughs> they said I was too aggressive. During all of this, I have led more than 2,000 people personally to faith in Jesus Christ. I'm asking you this morning, does God use you? I've preached in hundreds of places around the world in many countries. I've graduated from at least three Bible colleges. I have several degrees. I've been a member of three churches where I pastored two of them. And I'm a nobody. I was licensed and ordained to the gospel ministry by a church that was established in 1825. The list goes on and on and on. Because I went all in. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain. 
Scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, pray without ceasing. Do you think that when my wife started praying as a young teenage girl that she saw this coming? I don't think so. But my wife put her faith on display to pray without ceasing. It does not mean to pray 24 hours a day, church, but it means to be persistent about what you pray. Because my wife believed that God would answer her prayer. Now I'm going to take about 10 minutes and share a testimony. I was born very poor, 65 years old, raised in West End, Cabbage Town. Anybody know about that? Grady Baby. Anybody in here Grady Baby? I'm the only living Grady Baby. There's one right back there. You don't look to be 75. Grady Baby. Born at the Grady Hospital. I had three sisters and a brother. My three sisters. I hope they're not listening. All became professional drug addicts and traded whatever they had for the drugs. And I have a mixed family. My, my niece, nieces and nephews, we're, we're all mixed up. My father was a professional convict, 27 years in and out of prison. Died and went to hell with 213 tattoos on him. I heard a young man share a testimony one time about his father was a dope man. My father killed the dope man's father. All I'm trying to tell you here is the life that I grew up in. First time I was arrested, I was driving with no license in Mansfield, Louisiana. I was 13 years old. When I was 16, less than two hours after I got my license, I was surrounded by four police cars. My wife was my girlfriend at the time, was with me. Got five tickets, was man threatened to shoot me. Life was not going well. When I was 17, I was kind of at a crossroad. I'm either going to, I'm going to have to change something and go in the military or follow my daddy's footsteps and go to prison. I chose the military. I wasn't there but about three weeks, and I was in their jail. <laughs> Possession of marijuana and AWOL. I was a hard-headed young man that lived for the world. Life was not going well. As my son was born, I, I wanted to live two lives, one for my family and one for the devil. So I gotta, I'm going to move on up to 2008. I went to buy some drugs over on University Avenue in Atlanta. Hadn't been gone 10 minutes. Phone rang. Have you been to the drug place there? I said, I have. They said, you're not going to believe what happened. Somebody came by and robbed them and killed both of them. That made me mad. I wasn't thinking they could have killed me, but I was mad because they killed my drug connection. <laughs> but God knew, God knew I would be in Stillwater Church today, January the 6th, 2024. Listen to this. 2009, I was in another place, drugs again, argument with a lady that had a pistol. I dared her to shoot me. They got me to leave, got my vehicle left the next morning. She shot her husband five times. She could have shot me. That made me mad again. She had killed my drug connection. She could have killed me, but God knew. God knew. 2010 comes along now. This is the year. My life was out of control. My heart was blacker than black. I had no reason to live. I didn't want to live anymore. And I made a very feeble attempt to take my own life, but it didn't work. So we ran into a friend later that summer in, in the parking lot at Publix. We'd known this lady for 20 years. Hadn't seen her in 17 years. She was on her way home for church. Her and my wife was standing in the parking lot talking. And my wife was, she, she lived a hard life. She could have left me a hundred times. And God would have said, it's okay. But because the covenant she made, before the eyes of God, she said, I'm going to ride this out. Now, let me tell you this. My wife would go to big church. Big church would say, you need to leave that man. He ain't never going to change. She'd go to another church. Another church would say, he won't never be no good. My wife's praying, God save my husband. So this lady invites me to a Bible study at her house. Here I am, a man out of control, no reason to live. Agreed to go. She allowed me to come over there on Monday nights. 
drinking, drunk. She'd take a break so I could go outside and smoke cigarettes. She was just glad I was there. And after a couple of months, after all the silly questions I would ask, God knew what was going on. The Bible I read said, no one comes to the Father unless he draws them. Well, right now he's, he's got that lure. He's, he's reeling that lure in. I didn't see this coming. She invited me to the church, First Baptist Church of Jonesboro. I went up there that, that first day I went. I sat down on the second row, like this brother over here. Preacher come out there, and that day he's preaching on sin. And, man, he knew where I was sitting. I mean, he, there was 2,000 people in the church, and he was talking to me. I got mad. It didn't take much to make me mad. I was an angry man. I said, this brother right here ain't got no business telling everybody about my business. You know, the, the sin of the church is gossip. As long as we're talking about yours and not mine. So he's preaching about sin. He said, I'll be out front. Service is over. I'd like to meet the visitors. I said, like, you're going to meet this guy. We're going to get this straightened out. I had no idea of the power of the Holy Spirit. I had no idea how this all worked. Went out there where he was standing. And he had something around him like a force field. I couldn't even get close to him. And I, I just kind of circled him like this. And, and I left. I'm really mad now. So I came back the next Sunday, and I came a little early. I sat in the same place. They had a choir. They had 180 people in the choir and 40 in the orchestra. And they all came in. I got a chance to see them. They first sat down. And when the music started and the spirit fell on the place, everything changed. They were raising their hands, and they were, like y'all were doing this morning, they were getting into it because the spirit came over them. And I thought, some of these people have been smoking weed. <laughs> I'm telling you what I'm thinking. I even told the pastor that. I said, I believe you've got some issues in the choir and you don't even know it. I can see it. He says, is that what you think? I said, I didn't know about the power of the Holy Spirit. That man, that pastor, eventually became my friend. Anyway, he came back and he started preaching on sin again. I didn't know what a sermon series was. But he didn't let up. Today he was really hammering it. And I thought, my wife has done told this man about me. He knows everything, and I can't even lie out of it. I'm going to meet him today. He said, I'll be out front. He issued another challenge. I went out there, and I, I got all the way to him, and I took his hand. And when he, he got my hand, he looked in my eyes, and he looked right into my heart. I couldn't make a word come out of my mouth. I was so ashamed. He was such a spirit-filled man. I pulled away from him. I was so, so upset. I remember getting out in the car. I called my friend. I said, you call that man. And tell him I want to talk to him behind closed doors. I was one of those people, I didn't want nobody to see me cry. I, I'm a man. Huh, I don't cry. He said, I can see him Thursday. This was on a Sunday. Thursday. I don't know if any of you have ever had a drinking or drug problem or ever had to go to court. But that four days was an eternity. I waited and waited. I drank and drank and drank and drank and took and did. And Thursday morning came and I remember I got up and I put my clothes on and like I was going to go to court. You know, you dress up, you shave, you comb your hair. I thought I was going to go to the church, get my wife off my back. You know, I've been lying to my wife now for, for 35, 36 years. And a professional liar could sell a lie. You can't make nobody believe the truth. There's one thing I've, I've learned about being a Christian man is when you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. When you tell a lie, you think, what did I say? If you tell the truth, it comes out the same every time. Thursday came, 2.30 in the afternoon. I went up there, and it was 2.30 sharp. I was about to get up walk out. He came around the corner smiling like it was funny. I'm like, brother, you was almost late. Come on in my office. Sat down. He said, my name is Mel Blackaby. What can I do for you? I said, well, sir, I'd like to change my life, and I don't know how to do it. Well, let me tell you a little bit about me. And he started talking about him. After a couple of minutes, I said, stop. This is not about you. This is about me. I'm dying here. Man, he slid a little bit closer to me. He's not afraid of me. He said, has anybody ever shared with you the gospel of Jesus Christ? I said, what? He said, what Christ done for you. And my, everything flashed. My, my life's going. I'm, he thinks I'm crazy. He thinks I don't know anything. And I knew that Jesus Picture was on the Bible. I knew Jesus' birthday was December 25th. I knew 
I didn't know nothing. He said, let me tell you what God done for you. He started telling me the most beautiful story I'd ever heard in my life, how Jesus Christ left eternity, came into time, walked these dirty, filthy, nasty roads, and when the time was right, he went to the cross and died for my sin so that a man like me could have another chance. I thought it was the most incredible story I'd ever heard, and I didn't believe none of it. This is what he said. He said, all you have to do is say what we call a sinner's prayer, Repent of your sin and ask Jesus Christ into your life. I'm watching HBO. I'm watching The Sopranos. I ain't believing no magic. I said, preacher, I don't even know how to pray. I'm telling you, I wish I could get saved every Thursday. I said, I don't even know how to pray. He said, I've done it a couple of times, and I can help you get through it. He said, you can repeat after me, or you can say what comes from your heart. I didn't have anything else to lose. He started doing business for God right there. The louder he prayed, the heavier the air got in the room. Before I knew it, I was on my knees on the floor, had my hands in the air, asking God to forgive me for what I'd done to my wife, asking God to forgive me for the things I'd done to my son, asking God to forgive me for the life I'd lived. And when it happened, it's like the song that John Newton wrote in the second verse. He said, the hour I first believed, when my faith was born, I believed that somebody was actually listening to me. I remember when I stood up and I took the deepest breath I'd ever breathed in my life when the Holy Spirit entered my body. It was like Jeremiah said there was a fire burning in my bones. I thought he'd done something to me while my eyes was closed. He had been crying. I had been crying. I couldn't even talk. We embraced each other. I said, preacher, I need to go tell my wife. He said, laugh. He said, no, you need to go tell the world. I remember when he opened the door of his office, the, the church secretary was there. She'd been listening. She tried to stand up. He said, Michael, tell Pam what just happened. I didn't know what to say. This is the words that came from my mouth. I just accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. In that room that day, there was a 1,000 pounds lifted off my back. I remember going outside and raising my hands in the air saying, thank you, God. I got my wife on the phone. I said, you are not going to believe what I've done today. She said, oh, Lord, Michael, what have you done? I said, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I heard her drop the telephone. Pick up the phone. In that room that day, God delivered me. My cocaine addiction was $200 a day if it was a penny. I knew where three liquor stores opened at 730 so I could get me a half a pint to settle my nerves. I made up some of the cuss words the prisoners use in prison. I smoked four packs of cigarettes a day, and I thought violence was a sport. But because of the cross of Calvary and the blood of Jesus Christ, I was made free. The Bible says to be free in the Son is to be free indeed. The Bible says by his wounds you have been healed. I believe what I preach. I believe what I say because it happened to me. I was set free. I became a new creation. My church didn't like me anymore. Well, he's the real deal. What are we going to do? People began to talk. What's wrong with this man? He's filled with the Spirit. I love what I do. I believe what I say. God is my Savior and nothing less than. I refuse to turn my head from sin. I refuse to bend to sin. I refuse to turn my back on the man that died for me. This is the best part. So God answers prayer. God uses people. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, and verse 31, there was a great earthquake. Paul and Silas were in prison. The jail cells broke open. And in Rome, the soldiers, if you lose your prisoners, you have to take your own life. The jailer was about to take his life. Paul said, no. No one has escaped. We're all here. The prisoner fell on his knees on the floor. He said, well, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, call on the name of Jesus. He will save you and your house. God honors his promises. My wife and I, the first year I was saved, I, I told my son for a whole year, and I'm ashamed of it, that he was going to die and go to hell because that's what I believed. I still believe it, but it's not my place to tell people that. There's only one judge, and he's on his way. So we began to pray for our son. First I prayed, God save my son. 
God saved my son. And then the Spirit changed my mind. He said, you prayed wrong. Thank God for saving your son. Then I changed my prayer to, Lord, thank you for the person you sent to witness to my son. Thank you, Lord, for saving my son. My son's going to come up here in a minute and, and share his story with you, but I'm going I'm to put this piece on the front. I took him to a place, South Georgia, and after three days, the phone rang. It was the pastor down there, and he said, Brother Michael, he said, we've got a problem. He said, your son won't get with the program. He won't cut his hair. He's cussing everybody out. You got to do something. We have to put him out. He said, if I call you, you'd take care of it. I heard him talking in the background. He said, I told you my dad take care of it. Put him on the phone. I said, Shane, I'm not coming to get you, but the sheriff is. He hung up. Two weeks later, phone rang again. This pastor, I said, oh, what has he done now? Like my wife. He was kind of crying on the phone. He said, I need to tell you what your son's done. I said, oh, Lord, what's my son done? He said, your son has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. The promises of God are real. If you believe, if you put your faith in God. The Bible I read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, says it's impossible to please God without faith. So I'm going to ask my son to come here, to come up here, Shane, He's going to tell you, because I know we, we have people in here, there's people in here that have loved ones that have addictions, loved ones that have drinking problems, have loved ones that have all kind of issues. But here's some evidence. I, I love this. This is my son, Shane. You need a, he's getting one. You know, we went to, I've been to Cuba 28 times, and I literally have commissioned everybody on the island of Cuba, 11 million people. I probably have talked to 10,000 to pray for my son before he was saved. And the year he got saved in 2018, when I got to take him back to Cuba, and he got to stand in front of the church so they could see the evidence of their prayers, it was overwhelming because God answers prayer. This is, this is my son, Shane. I'll, I'll try not to talk as long as him. I always get really nervous when I have to get up here and share, but it's God's story, so it's not mine. Let me call my nerves and pray. Lord, I thank you today for this opportunity. I pray if there's anybody here that's given up on a loved one, that they would know there's still hope, that you're still in the saving business. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Job 33, 28 says, He will redeem his soul from going down into the pit, and his life shall see the light. And for as long as I can remember, that's exactly where I live my life, in that pit of sin, drugs, lies, deceit, and selfishness. And I stayed in trouble with the police. The first time I got arrested, I was 21 for DUI. I remember calling my dad. Called him from jail, told him where I was, told him what I did. He said, I'll be there in the morning. I said, okay, this ain't going to work. So every time after I got locked up after that, I would call my grandmother and tell her where I was. because I didn't want him to say, the whole, say that again because it's already bad enough you're locked up and then you got to deal with him when he picks you up. So the last time that I got locked up was in August of 2018. At the time of my arrest, I had four grams of meth on me. And if anybody knows about meth, that's enough to get you three to five years in jail. But luckily, I didn't have what I had stashed at home with me, which was like 34 grams. My addiction was so bad, I didn't want to run out. You know, I always wanted. And at the end, I was smoking and snorting two to three eight balls a week by myself, just to let you know how bad my addiction was. So at this last arrest, when the Spalding County Police rolled up on me, I knew who had sent them. I knew in my heart that God had sent those police to lock me up, and I later found out that my own parents had prayed for me to get locked up. So that, that's a, that is a pretty bold prayer to pray for someone that you love. So 
if you have people out there that you love and care about, don't stop praying for them. And like most people, when they get in that situation, you know, they start asking, God, please help me. I'll do this. I, I didn't make any kind of deals with God in the back of that police car. I knew what I'd done. I was ready to accept my punishment. And after a few days in jail and a few phone calls to my grandma, guess who shows up? He was dead. And he had assembled a group of some of the most godly people that I know to pray over me. And like he said, he told me I was going to Hazelhurst, Georgia. I'd never heard of it before in my life, but now it will forever be a part of my testimony. And like he said, I went to a faith-based recovery. I've been in rehabs two or three different times. One time the sheriff took me in handcuffs. They made me stay in a padded room, this and that. But this was different. It was faith-based. And I think he took me in during the nighttime so I wouldn't escape. And it was literally in the middle of nowhere on a dirt road, on an old asphalt road that was broken down. And there was no escape. And the closest store was five miles away. And like he said, at the time, I had my long hair. I still had my bad attitude, and I didn't want no part of what was about to happen. And after the first few days, I'm thinking to myself, man, this is some kind of cult. All they want to do is talk about God and read the Bible and pray and this and that. And like he said, Pastor Steve, you'd have to know Pastor Steve to appreciate Pastor Steve. He's, a, he's been where I've been. He's been where Dad's been. He's been locked up. He's he got locked up for forging prescription, for stealing people's prescription when he was an exterminator going through their medicine cabinet. So he's been where I've been. If you hadn't been where somebody else has been, it's hard to relate to them. It's hard to know what they're going to share with you. So he called me into his office. Dad's version was a bit different. And anyways, I told Pastor Steve that I didn't want no part of this. He said, well, son, you got to do something. Actually, he said, boy, you got to do something. I said, well, let me make a phone call and see if I can get a ride out of here. And I called Dad, and he said, no, if anybody comes to get you, it'll be Spawn County Sheriff's. And like he said, I hung up on it. I looked at Pastor Steve, and I said, I think I'll give this thing a try. He said, okay, well, you got to cut your hair, and you got to bathe. And I, I don't know, for some reason, just uh, being hard-headed, I didn't, I thought I was doing something, trying to prove, make my last stand by not cutting my hair and bathing and all this and that. And then on September 11th of 2018, not, you all know what happened on 9-11 a few years ago. It's a tragic day in American history, but it will forever be the greatest day of my life. It was a Tuesday evening service. We went to church four or five times during the week. We had evangelists come in two or three times during the week. And this brother, Rusty Harper, came in. I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. I didn't know about the praying and all this and that. But when that brother prayed that night, he prayed the Holy Spirit in the room. And then he started preaching. And after he got done preaching, there was two of us. We had the little small pulpits on each side. The building we lived in was like 40 by 40 metal building. Little bitty. He went over, my friend went over here and he got saved. I went over here and said a little prayer and gave my life to God. But I didn't make a big deal out of it because I'd seen a lot of the guys come in and out. They'd say this, they gave their life to God, and then they'd go out on the back porch. And, they'd go out on the uh, back porch and still be talking about the same old things, acting the same old way. So I waited a few days. And then Friday morning came around, I went to Pastor Steve's office, and I wanted to tell him what I had done. And he said, I already know what you have done, because me and Miss Linda have talked about it, and she said, there's something different about Shane's countenance. And that is God's grace. And if you don't know what God's grace is, that's unmerited favor. It's something we can never earn, we can never buy. It's a free gift from God. And since that day, I'm going to share with you what God's done in my life. When I got out, like he said, I got to go to Cuba on my first mission trip and show them what an answered prayer looks like. My dad found this dentist that God had put into his life, and this dentist really changed my life because he fixed my smile free of charge. And when you give a man his, his smile back, you give him his confidence back. I got married, but that didn't go so well. That only lasted 11 months. And, and you got to... You, you got you to gotta wrap your mind around this. 
when somebody walks out on you and leaves, and you're only maybe less than a year clean, I had a decision to make. I could have went and got skin up, forgot about it, moved on. But I did something different this time. I prayed and asked for forgiveness to God for my part in her leaving. And I moved on. And I later learned that God takes people in and out of your lives because they're not going where you're going. It gets better. And then, you know, I still haven't been in front of the judge. I started praying in Hazelhurst. God, do something big in my case. Do something big in my case. The date kept getting pushed back, and then 2020 rolled around. COVID hit. Thinking, okay, God's really going to do something big. He's just going to make it go away. And then finally, 2021 came around in March. Got that letter, said, you got to go to court. So I finally had to go stand in front of Judge Fears down in Griffin in Spalding County. And he came out there, and he said, Mr. Flanoy, I was going to come out here and lock you up. I didn't know what to say. My heart, my stomach sunk. My lawyer, he really didn't know what to say. But thankfully, my dad had written down all the things that God had done in my life up to that point. For a year and a half, I went into the prison, to the Jackson Diagnostic Prison, shared with those men. I started going to seminary, which I graduated from in 2021. He, he read off this whole list, and Judge Fears says, okay, well, that's good, but I'm not ready to give you the victory. He gave me 18 months probation. He gave me a fine, 80, 80 hours of community service. I paid the fine off the first probation visit. After five or six months, she put me on non-report. And in 20, October of 2022, I'm free from the law. Now I am truly free. And this past September 11th makes five years clean from a 20-year meth addiction. So if you have anybody that you've given up on, any loved ones, don't give up on them. It's never too late. Thank you.